Hi, we move into Genesis 14 today and a story that seems so much different than the rest of Genesis and really much of the rest of the Bible other than books like Joshua and Judges that scholars' first impulse has been to discover sources and argue about when it came from because it seems like such a foreign entity. And yet, as we've been seeing throughout from the creation stories in the beginning until now, that depends upon the lens that scholars have. If we assume that there are sources, then you tend to see sources. If you assume a unified uh, story, you tend to see a unified story. Let's look at two examples from recent scholars so we can see how they approach this so differently. One from Klaus Westermann, a German scholar uh, writing in 1990, and you can note before you read it that he sees three sections here. 14 1 to 11, 14 12 to 14, apart from 18 to 20, and then 14 18 to 20. And he says about the first part, the first 11 verses where the lists of kings and places are, he describes that as an analytic report from outside Israel attesting to the battle and its outcome. And then quoting him, he says, verses 1 to 11 obviously smack of the scribe's desk. The clumsy way in which the lists have been worked in betrays this. And I just want to say with no hesitation here, what that's expressing is an implicit anti-Judaism that was very common to German scholars, and Westermann's probably the last of the generation of those that assumed that they were smarter than the original Jewish authors and they could see the mistakes and the quote-unquote clumsy way in which these things were put together. In contrast with a view that sees the original writers as highly competent uh, literary uh, writers or editors uh, whose work was not discovered as um, supposedly multiple sources until the last hundred and something years out of the more than 2,000 years that the text had existed. So a more recent approach from Gordon Wenham in 2014, who reads Genesis consistently as uh, part of a single narrative, notes that a different division, he says 1 to 16 rather than 1 to 11, and 17 to 14 as a three-way confrontation between Abram, the king of Sodom, and Melchizedek. And it's specifically against Westerman, he notes down below that verses 1 to 11, unlike Mesopotamian annals, which use the first person, this is a third person account. The brevity of the opening verses may be dictated by dramatic considerations as much as any other. And then he adds, the story would, however, lose much of its punch were the introductory verses omitted. Furthermore, the phraseology of Abram's speech in verses 22 to 24 seems to use terminology drawn from verses 11, 1 to 11 as well as from verses 12 to 16. In other words, however it came to be, it's a consistent source now and there's no need for Westerman's claim either that it's from outside Israel or engaged in clumsy editing. Um, two recent writings uh, uh, from scholars, though, on this tend to continue that work, although in a slightly different way. Notice that in Westerman's point three, he suggests uh, that verses 18 to 20, the cultic blessing scene, probably from the time of David, but more recent scholarship is the one I'll show you, argue for many hundreds of years later. For example, this one from Gard Grenerod, who's uh, written two monographs on chapter 14, and yet what he's about, as you can see from the title, is reading this as from Persian and other late uh, form formative places, trying to establish Judean ethnic identity in the face of the Persian hegemony at the time. And that may be the case, uh, but if it is, then we have to, he has to argue that this chapter was not part of Genesis uh, until that point. And as we'll see, uh, the flow is very different. This chapter is not uh, part of the flow from chapters 10 through 15, as we'll see. Uh, another approach uh, uh, recently, this is from 2016, the last one I saw was from 2021, uh, focusing on the Melchizedek passages, a case study for inner biblical and interbiblical interpretation. And what both this one from Chan and and uh, this one from Grand Rod have in common is paying almost no attention to how the plot of the story itself fits into the larger plot of Genesis. Uh, they tend to read Genesis as a collection of little stories from different places that can be extracted little pieces and connect those little pieces to other parts of the Bible for the primary purpose of saying where they came from. But almost none of these people mention Lot, who I think is the key character and the key purpose of this story. So to highlight another perspective on this, and this is following Wenham, but also using it from my own work. Links between Genesis 14 and the chapters before and 10 to 13, and then links between Genesis 14 and 15, suggesting that however these sources were written originally, they've been deeply integrated into the context. So looking uh, earlier than Genesis 14, the narrative context, we see a number of place names connected. But most importantly, we see Lot and the issue of settling, Yoshev there, uh, a number of times in chapter 13. It's really about the whole image of Lot settling near Sodom after he and his uncle Abram have a dispute. Actually, their herders have a dispute over wells. And so Abram magnanimously offers Lot the choice of where to go, and he picks the area and settles there near Sodom. 
And then in the chapters that follow, we see these, uh, or the chapter that follows in 15, we see these various links here. And I won't go over those all now. I'll go over them more when we get to chapter 15, but I'll post it on the web page so you can see those there. So a lot of evidence that Genesis 14, wherever it came from, is integrated tightly into the, the passage uh, around it. But one of the things that really is unusual are all the names and places. And in many ways, it's curious because they're largely irrelevant. Um, as Grossman says in my note below on the left, you see, he says, the most surprising element in this unit is the detailed description of the places conquered by the four kings. The locations themselves are irrelevant to the story, since Abram only chased the kings once they had left the area and traveled north, as we'll see. So Grossman writing recently, and not trying to look for sources, but reading the story that way. I'm not going to go over all the people and places. I've made this little chart so you can look at it for yourself. But so many of them, this entire page of them here, um, and as you can see, the ones in light purple are people, and the ones in light blue are places. Some of these have connections, and some of these we simply have no idea what they are or where they are. Now, when we look at a map, here, we can see that the story is presenting a ridiculously wide area. It's hyperbolic in many ways. If we were to look at the book of Samuel and see the battles uh, that Saul fought and that David are fighting uh, in the middle of 1 Samuel, um, it's all in this small little area here. It's really just in this little area. But this story would have Abram and his 318 men chasing uh, these people all the way up past the, where this map can go, past Hobah and all the way up to Damascus, which is absurd at some level, but it's suggesting kicking them out of Canaan. Uh, and we don't have to worry about the credibility of that as a real story at all. Um, we can just see this story for what it is, which is the question of monarchy and violence and war and Lot and Abram's choice. So we see here um, at the beginning as we enter into it, uh, the names of a bunch of these people, four against five, joined in a valley, um, which in some ways is like uh, the Philistines and the Israelites uh, cross the valley when David and, and Goliath meet up. It's also, as a number of scholars noted, echoing various scenes from the book of Judges, including the story of Gideon, where there's a valley. But it's also suggesting this is a common way of warfare in this land, uh, that people join forces in the valley. They're probably not likely to fight in the midst of the mountains, although they're the was that scene in 1 Samuel where Jonathan and his uh, helper uh, go up to the Mishmash Pass and hold off the Philistines. But the normal way, of course, is to have a war in the valleys, not up in the mountains where the soldiers can come at each other. And so what we see is they joined forces. Twelve years the five had served, uh, Chido, um, sorry, uh, Chidora Lamar, sorry, it's hard to say, isn't it? But in the 13th year they rebelled. And the image for rebellion, I want to look at all three of these passages. Uh, Westerman suggests it's not an accident the same verb is used in all these places for an uprising. And it is in Hezekiah's uprising and Ochiakim's uprising and Zedekiah's uprising. Let's look at one and we can see the pattern of them all. Um, he rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. And so what we see in these three, and to the extent that the, the Deuteronomistic history, especially Kings, was written before Genesis, Genesis, as I've been taking, is a largely exilic text, the audience would know that that's what their ancestors had to deal with. That if they're going to have kings, they're going to get taken over by kings, and then they're going to need their kings to relieve them of other kings and all the things that kings do. And the story of Genesis is away from kings and away from cities and all that. And Abram's general test, and including his Abraham and his descendants, is to see if they can be faithful to Yahweh away from the temptation of cities and kings. And so after the rebellion, we see that the, the people they rebel from come and subdue the Rephaim, and we don't need to worry about these people and all these other places. Then they turn back and subdued all this country. So it's suggesting they're going through an enormous amount of country here. Here's Amorites here and Horites here and all these people on the other side of the Jordan River. Um, and uh, it'd be, it would be quite a battle if that was a historic event. But again, we don't need to worry about those details. Uh, then we get Sodom and Gomorrah named in particular, as well as Zeboim and Zoar, which all four of which will occur in Genesis 19, uh, reminding us that Lot was part of this picture. But Lot hasn't been mentioned yet. If we're careful readers, we should remember that. And we, there's a certain amount of suspense here as we're wondering, wonder what happened to Lot since we know he settled in that area. Uh, so the author, I would suggest, is placing this in this um, sequence after Genesis 13 precisely to set up suspense in the audience, to say there's this giant battle which seems to have nothing to do with Abram and nothing to do with Lot, and yet it's in Sodom, and so it must have something to do with Lot. What will Abram do is the, is the question here. And so as they flee, we see the enemy took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. And they also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who lived in Sodom and his goods and departed. 
Uh, and that's really the key point here, I think, that they took Lot. Um, as we see in my note down below, um, whereas chapter 13 saw Lot separating from Abram in order to avoid strife, it's ironic, therefore, that his move actually involves him in the greater strife of intercity warfare, which is exactly the point, I would say, of this chapter. Not so much the the mysterious and probably unanswerable question of what source it came from or exactly when it might have been written uh, separate from the rest of Genesis, but the plot point that Lot represents the people, whether in the king's story and the exilic story, who think that settling in a monarchy or an empire is going to provide them security. And it doesn't for Lot and it didn't for the Israelites and Abram is going to avoid that. But it puts him to quite the test. Uh, and that's what the rest of the plot of the story is. Because now after verse 12, we see what going on. Let's just look at uh, one more or two more verses and then we'll pick it up next time. So one who had escaped, we don't know who that is, um, but a messenger there, came and told Abram the Hebrew. And we can get into a lot of issues about Hebrew, and I won't get into too much of that here. It's the first of 35 uses of it in the Hebrew scripture. And there are three primary ways that scholars look at this. One is to see this as similar to words from other lo local languages uh, that suggest that it's echoing uh, a group of low class, either migrant workers, or slaves or others who rebel against their leaders and organize as low-level low rebellions. But that argument, long accepted by scholars in the mid and late 20th century without argument, was definitively refuted, I would say, by Meyer Sternberg's epic over 900-page tome, Hebrews Between Cultures, where he methodically goes through with the kind of detail that only Sternberg can do, either exhaustive or exhausting, depending on your approach. But because the false consensus he sees it is so ingrained, he feels the need to refute it with no hesitation. And so after hundreds and hundreds of pages, he shows shows what he calls a Hebrewgram, which is a specific way of using the word Hebrew as an ethnic slur word um, against Israelites, either by outsiders or by insiders, as Saul uses it sometime against his fellow soldiers, the way many black people might use the N-word toward each other, very different than when it's used by outsiders. And the word Hebrew from Ibri in Hebrew, apart from what echoes it might have to other cultures, means a crosser or one who crosses over from Eber here, which is one of the ancestors ancestors that we see in the Table of Nations and also in the uh, short genealogy of Abram in Genesis 11. And so that leads some to suggest to hear that here it isn't Hebrew, it's Ab Abram from across the river, which was the name of the province of Yehud during the Persian period. And that's the thrust of that uh, dissertation uh, monograph, actually, that I showed you earlier um, about that. Um, but we don't have to worry about that here. We can hear that this is someone who's not an Israelite because plainly there are no Israelites yet because the name Israel derives from Abram's grandson, Jacob, who's given the name Israel by someone he wrestles with angel or whoever else that might be and so um, so Abram the Hebrew living by the oaks of Mamre and living here is one of those uh, words that connects here with previous but it contrasts with Lot who had settled in Sodom and the word for settled is almost always a negative word uh, for uh, settling too soon which is to say uh, residing in a place when you should keep moving whereas what Abram is doing is uh, not building a house and living in a city but settling by the oaks of Mamre, here is a person, Mamre the Amorite, as opposed to Mamre a place. So again, the contrast between Lot, caught up in the war between the city leaders known here as kings uh, from his residence in Sodom and Abram living transitorily by the oaks with three uh, friends, or whatever they might be called here from the Hebrew, New Revised Standard here calls them allies, but literally they're Baali Verit, Lords of Covenant, which is only here in the Hebrew scripture. Septuagint, not knowing what to do with that, uses the word sunomotai, meaning a fellow conspirator. And yet they're not part of the story until the very end when there's a question of rewarding them. So it seems like he's not alone. Notice there's no mention of Sarai here. Um, she's not Sarah yet. There's no mention of her. It's just suggesting him by himself, which might suggest to some uh, a story from a different time period. But Sarah's not always mentioned. The story's not about her. It's about Abram having to deal with his nephew Lot.
Uh, and so uh, the scene will be set up, and we'll just give this last verse to uh, before we uh, take a, the break for this video. When Abram heard that his nephew, or literally his kinsman, or his brother, had been taken captive, um, and that's only a couple of other times in Genesis, but a number of times in Hebrew Scripture, because being taken captive was something that happened. Uh, he led forth his trained men, and we need to look at this in some detail. It's a rare verb here in the Hifal, Arik, only two times in Genesis, here in 42, 35, 19 times in Hebrew scripture, literally means to empty out, especially the sword from its sheath. And Sarna notes the usage here is unique and maybe elliptical, meaning he armed them. But here's where we need to look at the details. His trained men, um, which is to say, what kind of training? The word literally means dedicated, as Westerman notes. And, and so does that mean dedicated to the military or does that mean their experience? What experience would they have? If we see them as hired mercenaries, well, that doesn't make sense of the next scene. It says born in his house. Not literally in his house, he doesn't have a house, but to say born within his ambit, the house of Abram. But 318 of them? How could that possibly be that Abram has lost Lot, but in the short period of time when he still doesn't have a child, 318 men have come to be in his house and now they're all uh, ready to fight? Um, so since that seems so bizarre, um, the Midrash uh, sees it another way, that the number 318 is seen um, as the numerical value of, El value of Eleazar, who we'll see in 15.2, Abram appeals to, to Yahweh as the only source of inheritance for what he has. Has. In other words, instead of his family member Lot, he calls upon his eldest servant Eleazar. And so the Midrash links those together, finding the numerical value of the Hebrew of Eleazar to be 318. And they can, Genesis Rabbah concludes, it was Eleazar alone, the numerical value of Eleazar being 318. So rather than 318 soldiers, it's just Abram and Eleazar chasing them as far as, far as Dan, which is, say, the traditional northern boundary of the nation state of Israel in the time of Mon. Monarchy. And so with that set up, um, with Abram chasing these soldiers from four different kings, um, all the way up with one man or 318 men, we'll see how that battle uh, carries out and how he gets Lot in our next video. See you then. Bye-bye.